we come together this morning to say goodbye to our colleague and friend, Lady Arden, to celebrate her remarkable achievements as counsel, as chair of the Law Commission, and as a judge, and to recognize and thank her for the valuable contribution that she has made to the law, to the courts, and to the progress of women at the bar and in the judiciary. I'm delighted to see so many of Mary's family and friends in court, including her husband, uh, Lord Mance, formerly, of course, our deputy president, and their children and grandchildren. I'm also very pleased to welcome the many distinguished guests who are present in court, including the Deputy Prime Minister and Lord Chancellor, the Master of the Rolls, the Solicitor General, and a large number of Mary's former colleagues. I'm delighted that we're also joined online by judges and uh, other guests from all over the world, a reflection of Mary's work in the field of international judicial relations, which I'll speak about later. So many guests have joined us that it would be impractical to welcome you all individually, so please excuse my not doing so, but simply saying that whether you are here in court or are watching online, I'm delighted that you've all joined us to honor Mary on the occasion of her retirement. Mary Arden comes from Liverpool, where her father, grandfather, and brother were all members of a family firm of solicitors. After reading Lord Cambridge, where she was awarded a star at first, she was a Kennedy Scholar at Harvard Law School and was then called to the bar in 1971. She practiced for over 20 years at Erskine Chambers, specializing in company law. She took silk in 1986 and served as Attorney General of the Duchy of Lancaster. In April 1993, she was appointed to the High Court, which means that she's now served as a senior judge for 28 years and eight months, one of the longest periods of service on the bench in modern times. She was chair of the Law Commission between 1996 and 1999, and a member of the steering group of the Company Law Review, established by the Department of Trade and Industry, which preceded the Companies Act of 2006. She was appointed to the Court of Appeal in 2000. She spent 18 years on that court, serving for 13 of them as head of international judicial relations for England and Wales, responsible for liaison between the English courts and other courts around the world. In October 2018, she was appointed to the Supreme Court. She's the author of a large number of significant judgments, particularly, but by no means only, in the field of trusts, charities, and companies, human rights law, and, uh, and uh, statutory interpretation. She has also written extrajudicially on a wide range of matters, including company law, human rights law, and comparative law. She's also served as a member of a permanent court of arbitration in The Hague, and as an ad hoc judge of the European Court of Human Rights, where she sat on a case with important implications for the law of negligence. Those are the bare facts of Mary's career. They make it evident that she has had a very distinguished career of public service and has played an important part in the law. But they don't really explain what has been special about her contribution. I would emphasize two aspects of her work in particular. First, she has been a pioneer for women lawyers and judges in an especially male-dominated area of the law. There had, I think, been six women appointed to the High Court before Mary. All of them had practiced in either family or criminal law. Five of the six had been assigned to the family division and the sixth to the Queen's Bench Division. Mary was the first woman to be appointed to the High Court who had practiced in a business or commercially orientated area of the law. 
and she was the first to be assigned to the Chancery Division. She was the first woman to be appointed to the Court of Appeal who had not come from the Family Division. She was also the first woman to be appointed to this court who had not come from the Family Division. She was the first woman to chair the Law Commission. Indeed, she remains the only woman to have done so. Mary has also demonstrated a commitment to encouraging girls and women to follow in her footsteps through her activities with schools, universities, and women in the law, and also through her chairing the working party of the Judges' Council, which supported the setting up of an independent Judicial Appointments Commission to enhance the confidence of women and people from ethnic minorities who wish to apply for appointment. The second aspect of Mary's career, which seems to me particularly characteristic, is her work in furthering relationships between judges in this country and in other jurisdictions. She has demonstrated in her judgments, as well as in her other activities, a firm belief in the value of comparative law. She has also shown a strong commitment to developing a better understanding of our legal system among judges overseas, and to developing a better understanding of other legal systems among judges in this country. Her efforts in this field have covered virtually the entire globe, with the possible exception of Antarctica, <laughs> but are exemplified by her work in building stronger relationships with the highest courts in France, Germany, Japan, and the United States, with the European Court of Justice, and with the European Court of Human Rights. The judiciary in this country, when Mary joined the bar in 1971, was a male-defined institution with relatively little engagement with the legal world beyond our shores, and inclined to think, as a judge once told me, that the expression, a change for the better, was a contradiction in terms. The gender balance, although still unequal, has improved considerably across the judiciary during the course of Mary's career. And in other respects, the judiciary has changed a great deal, embracing innovation and taking its place in the wider world. Mary Arden has been a significant figure in that process. Mary's colleagues on the Supreme Court will miss a colleague who has stood out for her independence of mind, her careful attention to all aspects of a case, and her encyclopedic knowledge of company law, and who has been an inspiring pioneer and a valued friend. Mary, we wish you all the best as you face new challenges and new opportunities. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to invite Elspeth Talbot Rice, <coughs> Queen's Counsel, to speak. My lady, my lady, my lords, we are gathered here together to join I hope you're not getting worried about where I'm going with this. <laughs> yes. To join with His Lordship in thanking Your Ladyship and in paying tribute to Your Ladyship for your stellar and long-lasting contribution to the law, both as a Chancery Barrister and as a judge. Your Ladyship has blazed a bright trail to the very top, as bright as the trail lit by John McLean, played by Bruce Willis in Die Hard 2, which enabled an incoming aircraft to land in zero visibility. Like that, the trail your ladyship has blazed has been and is a bright beacon to all lawyers, but particularly women lawyers, and most especially women at the Chancery Bar. Your ladyship has shown us all not only that it can be done, but how it can be done. You will continue to be an inspiration. But let me go back to the beginning. We were lucky to have had your ladyship at the bar at all, for at least five reasons. First, as my Lord Lord Reed has said, your family were, for at least three generations, solicitors in the family firm in Liverpool, where you, you yourself did a stint as an assistant there. During which period, I understand that a county court judge threw a book at you. That's the second reason why we are lucky to have had your ladyship at the bar. Those of lesser resolve than your ladyship would have been put off a life at the bar at that moment. 
Thirdly, obtaining pupillage in the 1970s was not the open, fair and transparent process it is now. When your ladyship did pupillage, there was no systematic application process at all, and such process as there was was Dickensian. Your ladyship attributes getting the pupillage you wanted to the fact that following a fire, chambers had just been relocated to a place which had facilities for both sexes. Fourthly, there were some areas of the law at the time which were not particularly welcoming to women. Some, not all, but some commercial chambers felt that they could not cater for women since shipping arbitrations were commonly held in the old Baltic Exchange and involved both crossing the floor of the Baltic Exchange and dining in the dining room, to which neither place women were permitted access. Fifthly, your ladyship felt constrained to sign your opinions M. H. Arden, so that the solicitors who had had the foresight to instruct your ladyship did not have to reveal to their clients that they had instructed a woman. It is therefore a wonder on all counts that your ladyship chose to take on and beat all the odds and become a Chancery Barrister. It is a testament to your ladyship's determination and resilience that you did so. It is the great fortune of your colleagues at the bar and the development of the law that you did so, and it makes the example that you have given the rest of us all the more impressive. Over the course of your ladyship's 22 years of practice from Erskine Chambers, your ladyship managed to juggle the burdens and delights of maintaining a busy and hugely successful practice, marrying Jonathan, having two daughters and a son, and always being available to help juniors in Chambers as a result of Chambers' open door policy, which meant that juniors could pop into your ladyship's room and ask your ladyship the answer to the tricky legal problem they had been given to solve. Your ladyship's leaders were always grateful for the comprehensive nature of your ladyship's assistance to them. One leader commenting that your ladyship's frighteningly comprehensive system of domestic notes and messages was equally efficiently duplicated and deployed on the one occasion when your ladyship was instructed to act as his junior. <laughs> Whilst your ladyship specialised in company law at the bar, your ladyship's chancery experience was not restricted to the law of companies. On the contrary, your ladyship had first-hand experience of the law of trusts, by virtue inter alia of your ladyship's involvement in the Chamber's Trust Fund. It was settled with a modest amount won on the pools by staff and members of Chambers. Its sole trustee was the late Oliver Weaver, Queen's Counsel, who had a particular interest in horse racing. That no doubt explained the very unusual investment policy of the Trust which was to place bets on horse races, backing only horses with names of a legal flavour. I understand the fund did very well out of a horse called Charter Party. And Oliver had high hopes of an inform English thoroughbred called Mary Arden. Not to be confused with the eight-year-old French thoroughbred of the same name, which ran two races as a two-year-old in 2016 and came second to last in both. <laughs> Alas, however, your ladyship's English-bred namesake did not augment the Chamber's trust fund for reasons explained by the headline in the Racing Post the following day, which declaimed, Mary Arden impeded by a dog at toaster. <laughs> Your ladyship's practice at the bar, however, was unimpeded, whether by a dog at toaster or otherwise. As my Lord Lord Reed has set out, your ladyship's appointment to Silk led quickly to your ladyship's appointment as the first female High Court Judge of the Chancery Division. The welcome speeches delivered on the first day of your ladyship sitting on the Chancery bench included a welcome on behalf of the family bar. Although I apprehend the advocate who delivered that speech knew more about demurrage than he did about divorce, and the family bar on whose behalf he spoke was not located in the Royal Courts of Justice. I wonder how many of the public on that occasion were perplexed, if not alarmed, when your ladyship turned to the advocate in question and addressed him in the traditional words of the Chancery Court in which we sat, the Motions Court, by asking him, Mr Mance, 
do you move? <laughs> Their anxiety can only have grown when your ladyship received the response. I hope that I may have your ladyship's ear. Your ladyship set out then to achieve what your ladyship described on that occasion as the guiding principle, which was to make the law work. And that is what your ladyship has done. Not only as a judge at all levels, but also by your ladyship's contributions to innumerable law panels and committees. I have to confess to uh, becoming somewhat dizzy with exhaustion as my Lord, Lord Reed, set out what he described as the bare facts of your ladyship's activities in the law. Uh, and if those activities were not energetic enough, your ladyship has also written extrajudicially with two volumes on how the law keeps pace with social change published in 2015, available from all good bookshops, and spoken extrajudicially on many and diverse topics, including on all the laws of stage, Shakespearean insights and their resonance today. My lady, happy birthday for yesterday. Thank you for your inspiration to us all, and particularly to women at the bar and in the law. An inspiration which will live on long, long beyond your ladyship's retirement. A retirement in which you will have the time to see as much of your grandchildren, Thomas, Edward, Eliza and Chloe, who we are delighted to see have secured day releases from school to be here today. More time to enjoy trips to the theatre and exhibitions. And time to join Jonathan in pursuing your joint love of walking. For which purpose we join with Jonathan in hoping that your ladyship will invest in a new pair of walking boots and not repeat the mistake of undertaking the great traverse of the Gorge de Verdun in the south of France up the scree rather than up the footpath, where one step up was at least one step down, and in a pair of walking shoes rather than walking boots, which shoes did not survive your assault on the scree and the scree's assault on the shoes, and were ceremoniously pushed over a cliff, toes, toes peeled back and open. My lady, we at the bar are immensely sorry to lose you as a judge. 28 plus years is not enough. But you leave us with our very best wishes for a happy, healthy, energetic and fulfilling retirement. It's now my pleasure to invite Professor Dame Sarah Worthington to speak. My lady. My lady, my lords, it's a privilege and a pleasure to add some further words of appreciation this morning as we gather to mark Lady Arden's departure from the Supreme Court. It's unusual to have an academic speak on these occasions. Unusual and perhaps rather brave. Many of you will recall Lord Newberger's wry observation about academics, that only one thing is certain, whatever we decide, it will be criticised. So Lady Arden perhaps wonders uh, what is coming next. But the unusual and the brave is Lady Arden's style. We've been reminded of her many achievements as a barrister, a law commissioner, a judge, and her significant contributions to forging a path for women in the law. But Lady Arden is, by her own account, proud of her academic background and her instincts. Through that lens, I might be permitted an academic take on Lady Arden's contributions. Lady Arden's intellectual abilities have already been noted. Her starred first in Cambridge, her formative LLM undertaken as a Kennedy Scholar at the Harvard Law School, which probably confirmed her path as a comparative and interdisciplinary lawyer. But even then, it seems her career trajectory was obvious. One of Lady Arden's contemporaries told me that even in her first year, Lady Arden was very glamorous, with quite a sparkle, and was clearly someone who was going places. And so she did. But that glamour and sparkle comes with a slightly intimidating intellectual fierceness. And I mean that with the, as the warmest of compliments. It, demands the best of others. But her inquisitions, and surely it's not just me, 
Uh, her inquisitions always come with a warmth and a genuine engagement that suggests that you will know things that Lady Arden regards as worth knowing. Since she seems to adopt that approach wherever she goes, with everyone she meets, she has ended up knowing a lot about a lot of things. Her horizon scanning for the future needs of the law is well known, and that instinct seems to be crucial in all she does. But first, a step backwards. Paul Finn, an academic and an Australian federal court judge, once said, and I, I paraphrase, that judges are required to look down one highly illuminated hole, as you hear that case, and then down another hole with the next case, but you don't need to see the connectedness of things in the way that an academic might do. Clearly, when he said this, he was talking to academics, not to judges. But that's not the case with Lady Arden. Indeed, I suppose, thankfully, it's not the approach of many judges. This is seen very clearly in Lady Arden's time as chair of the Law Commission. This is a job that's close to her heart, and I pause on it here. Few chairs of the Law Commission have had the good fortune she did, and we've heard of her good fortune already, to have charge not of one, but of two large projects so wonderfully aligned with her own interests and expertise. In handling those projects, one on shareholder remedies, the other on director's duties, Lady Arden grasped with both hands the opportunity to see the connectedness of things. She sought out advice from around the globe. She considered input not just from lawyers, but from cognate disciplines with different expertise, and crucially, from people who might see or experience the law from different perspectives. Lady Arden's early Harvard experiences may have settled for good that, as I've said before, comparative and interdisciplinary instinct that was on display here. All of these inputs were then brought to bear on Lady Arden's guiding ambition to make the law work, and to that end, with others, she must have been delighted to see those detailed Law Commission proposals expanded upon by the Company Law Review, with her as a member of the Steering Committee, and then largely enacted in the massive Companies Act 2006. This desire to make the law work is equally evident in Lady Arden's many lectures. The range and the forward-looking focus of her interests are reflected in her two OUP volumes. The first on building new legal orders through human rights law and European law, and the second on the common law and the crucial need for it to keep pace with social change. I suppose we might deduce, once a law reformer, always a law reformer. But Lady Arden's law reforming comes with a keen appreciation of the limits of the judicial role. In her judgment, she has put into practice her view that judges, of course, need integrity and a knowledge of the law. That's essential to the rule of law. But they also need humanity uh, and a keen awareness of the current social context. And they need uh, to apply an ever-present push to make the law socially relevant. These various skills and interests and strengths, I think, all came to play in what Lady Arden described to me as her favorite judicial role, as head of the Inst International Judicial Relations for England and Wales, a sort of foreign secretary for the judiciary tasked with facilitating relations with other judges internationally. This role really puts meat on the bone of the idea that we are intellectually, and in many other ways, enriched by a knowledge of our differences. But Lord Reid has already spoken of that. So I can close with others in congratulating Lady Arden on her many, many achievements, and wishing her every success and happiness in her future endeavors. I, and I'm sure many, many others, have every expectation that Lady Arden will still be going places, even as we lose her from the Supreme Court. Lady Arden now has a right of reply. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you all, Lord Reed, Sarah and Elspeth, very much for your kind words. Uh, flattery is all right, so long as you don't inhale. 
Uh, what is it about my career that I would most like to be remembered for? I was expecting someone to say uh, that it, it, the most notable thing was the way it has run in parallel with that of my husband. Our tandem was indeed a first for the judiciary, but I hope it will not be the last. As a sitting judge, most of my time has been devoted to administering justice, but I would like to rem be remembered also for the principles for which I have stood. They obviously include judicial independence and access to justice, but there are two others I would most particularly like to mention. The first is judicial diversity and its importance. When I was a teenager, helping out, as you've heard, in my father's office, the managing clerk behind my back sucked his teeth and said, it's a pity, she's not a man. In the spirit of the age, I took that as a compliment, as I did when I came across similar attitudes during my subsequent career, and it has proved a useful response. I, as you've heard, I went to the Chancery Bar and I could not have asked for finer pupilages than I had with Richard Sykes and John MacDonald. While there, I had no real hope that women would ever be appointed to the Chancery Bar, to Chancery Bench. It was still the dark ages. Women were invisible, there was no judicial appointments commission, and the process was a tap on the shoulder. I recall how my break arrived. I had no idea I was in the running. My husband and I came home one Saturday evening to find a message, apparently addressed to me, from our French au pair saying, Le Lord Chancellor rang. Please ring him back. <laughs> no number was there, so I assumed the message was a practical joke. But the following Tuesday saw me being ushered into the Lord Chancellor and invited to sift sit on a very soft sofa while he sat on a relatively hard chair. I pointed out that I was rather too young to go on the bench, but Lord Mackay explained, perfect time in your career. Once appointed, I took it upon myself to see if judicial titles for the High Court could be made gender neutral. That meant getting support from my fellow judges for changing Mr. or Mrs. Justice to simply Justice. Lord Bingham suggested a compromise, Madam Justice. I politely declined. <laughs> I lost the battle over judicial titles, just as I'd lost the battle to have a creche in the Inns of Court in the 1970s. Both ideas were victim of a principle, a well-known principle of unright time. In principle, something ought to be done, but this is not the right time to do it. This principle has never appealed to me. More fundamental than titles, though, is the vital importance of judicial diversity in general. Judicial decisions are enriched by diverse backgrounds and experiences. The fact that everyone thinks the answer is X does not mean that X is necessarily the right or the complete answer. We need the challenge of several different approaches. Judicial diversity brings real benefits to judicial reasoning. Lady Hale and Baroness Newberger have done fantastic things to promote diversity. My own approach has been really to work behind the scenes over many years to increase diversity, knowing that many others in government and parliament were working in the same direction. At one stage, I even engaged the national statistician who usefully showed that record keeping on diversity was inadequate. Now the penny has dropped. There are many women at the Chancery Bar. I'm delighted to see that. And I hope that many more diverse candidates will come forward for the bench and be given a full part. They must not only be invited to the party, they must also be asked to dance. The second principle I would like to be remembered for is the importance of the international perspective. I ended my term at the Law Commission with a lot of accumulated leave, and I decided to take it at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. The court gave me full access to the judges and to files. It was fascinating. Once there, I was asked by the senior judiciary here to be the ad hoc UK judge in place of our permanent judge for two grand chambers cases. 
One of them was Zed in the United Kingdom, a tragic case about several children who suffered extreme neglect at the hands of their parents. Their, the parents' failings were not spotted by the local authority. The UK courts held that the local authority owed no duty of care. Over the next two years, I had the task of explaining to the Strasbourg court how the common law operated and that the ruling was on a preliminary issue of substantive law and not the grant of immunity. That was what the court ultimately accepted. In the end, everyone could see that Strasbourg had taken time to understand the very different approach of the common law. If this case had gone the other way, as Lord Reed said, it would have completely undermined the UK law of negligence. But the case led to a flowering of good relations between Strasbourg and the UK courts. There are differences, but there is also goodwill and a willingness to engage in discussion. And Strasbourg carefully analyzes the case law of our courts. Our courts give judgments which directly interpret convention rights. By contrast, judges in countries with written constitutions are interpreting constitutional rights, not convention rights. But the international perspective stretches for this, this country far beyond Strasbourg. Following constitutional reform in the UK, the judiciary took over from the Ministry of Justice the small budget allocated for judicial international travel. The judiciary had to decide how to use it. So Lord Wolfe, then Lord Chief Justice, asked me to do a report about how the judiciary of England and Wales should conduct international relations within this budget. I thought this, the answer was that we should aim to influence and to learn a reciprocal process. On the influencing side, we could help other systems reduce the inordinate court delays common in certain countries, or we could show them how the flexible and principled approach of English commercial law promotes innovation and, crucially, economic development. On the other side of the coin was learning. This meant learning exclusively, but especially but not exclusively, from other Commonwealth Supreme Courts and other common law systems about subjects like comparative fundamental rights and constitutional law. For 13 years, as you have heard, I headed international judicial relations for England and Wales, operating with Scotland and Northern Ireland when we could. I instituted regulated, regular bilateral exchanges with Strasbourg and promoted bilateral exchanges with other Supreme Courts, South Africa, Ireland, India, and so on. Were there awkward moments? Yes, there were. For instance, we were faced with a very pressing invitation to explain the rule in Belarus. We declined. No international relations could be conducted if it might cause reputational damage. Another awkward moment occurred when arrangements were in hand with appropriate consents for a visit by distinguished judges and lawyers from the United States, including members of their Supreme Court. The UK was due to host the visit and about two weeks beforehand, I was told there was no money for this exercise and there was no option but to cancel. Never say never is a judicial doctrine. So I rang round for help. Lincoln's Inn and Royal Holloway University of London, of which I am the visitor, rode to the rescue. I'm very grateful to them for spontaneously providing generous facilities and hospitality for this two-day event. It meant we had some excellent working sessions at the magnificent campus of Royal Holloway and then went to nearby Runnymede, where Magna Carta had been signed, a highlight of the whole exchange. And the international work was strongly supported by all the Chief Justices under whom I served, and I'm very grateful to them. Discussion with judges overseas has been seminal in my judicial work as it had made it easier for me to work with different systems of law and learn about their solutions to our common problems. To make the UK jurisprudence more accessible and influential across the world, we need to show how we have considered other relevant systems of law. Sitting in this court has been an experience without equal. At the second appeal level, there is a chance for more rigorous debate and the scrutiny of the law. And it has also been a pleasure and a privilege to sit on the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council and to look at decisions reached in another jurisdiction. We have made the road together. And now it's time to pass on the baton 
I hand the baton over at a time when the courts of the United Kingdom are strong, both intellectually and organizationally. I'm particularly happy to pass on the role of senior woman judge in this court to Lady Rose, and I wish her and all my colleagues all good fortune. And now the thank yous. I won't name names, but I remember with huge gratitude those who helped me at the bar, those who made it possible for me to work and have my much-loved children, my judges and barristers' clerks, my remarkable personal assistant in the Supreme Court, the international team of the Judicial Office of the Royal Courts of Justice, and many others in the Lord Chief's Office, legal scholars, judges overseas, my brilliant judicial assistants here and in the Court of Appeal, the librarians both in the RCJ and here who never fail to impress, my court ushers, the listing officers, the staff of this court, and indeed all those who seamlessly organize the administration of justice and the work of the judiciary. I would like to thank also those who've advised and encouraged me and provided me with opportunities. Thanks too to the independent bar who've done their best to educate me. I also want to thank those in public bodies, government and parliament, who've supported my extracurial activities of one kind or another. To my colleagues, past and present, both here and in the Court of Appeal and on the High Court, may I say how much I have enjoyed working with you. And a big thank you too to my husband, my family and friends. Thank you all for your magnificent support. So to wrap up, international judicial relations contributes to the rule of law. My greatest hope is that the UK will continue to promote with every sinew the rule of law and the international rule of law. At home, the rule of law is essential for a vibrant and tolerant society, while the international rule of law promotes global peace and security. Let us lead by example. I aim to continue to make some contribution outside of this court. So thank you everyone for being here today, either digitally or in person, to give me such a warm send off. Farewell and fare forward. Thank you. Well, that brings our ceremony to a close. I can't forbear from saying how impressed I am by the impeccable behavior of Mary's four grandchildren over the past 45 minutes. Uh, the two little girls here have been studiously working on their drawings. Um, <laughs> and the, the two boys have been listening attentively to everything that's been said. Um, when we adjourn in a moment, uh, there will be refreshments available in the space at the back of behind the court, and I hope you'll join us there. And now, uh, for the moment, the court will adjourn.